For people who understand Bitcoin's going up 100% a year, anytime you're choosing to spend money on something, you're like, am I comfortable spending twice as much on this? Or am I comfortable spending three times as much as today's price? Because that's the opportunity that I'm choosing to forego. Bitcoin is now your hurdle rate as a business investor. If this opportunity doesn't have more than a 50% chance of 100% annual return, you're probably misallocating your resources. This is legit the industrial revolution for the digital world. Bitcoin is the solution, honestly, to these political career politicians. I don't think they'll exist under a Bitcoin standard. Bitcoin will be very healthy considering our current global debt situation because Bitcoin is a savings technology and the technological innovation is that it incentivizes people to save rather than to spend. Bitcoin is freedom money. I love it for the fact that it's kind of the opposite of what fiat represents, which I see it as a form of slavery. If we're, if we're going to do this, let's do this. You know, I'm not, okay. uh, I'm not hiding. I'm, uh, <laughs> if they want to come for me and, uh, take my Bitcoin, uh, bring it on. <laughs> I love that attitude <laughs> a lot. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, yeah, then let's, let's get started. Hi, Michael. How are you doing? Everything fine? Uh, doing well, Robin. I appreciate you uh, having me on. Uh, perfect. Amazing. Um, and it's your first ever podcast. And this is like um, uh, uh, really interesting for me to see when people get to the first ever pop podcast. Uh, and you thought like, should I do it? Should I not do it? What what uh, was the main thing that you're like, okay, I, I want to speak about Bitcoin publicly. I want to get the, the void, uh, the, the, the message out there. Yeah, I guess... Uh... You know, maybe what you're doing is uh, part of my motivation for stepping up and uh, <clears throat> just throwing my voice in the ring here. Um, you know, you've had a lot of people on your show that 99.9% .9 of uh, people trying to grow a channel wouldn't consider. And uh, I think that that's a very noble, worthwhile thing. And uh, just want to be supportive and uh you know, provide what value I can to the community. Yeah, and I think you can provide a lot of value and a, and a lot of what you're doing. And you, we had a little talk before we started the podcast and I loved what you're saying about Bitcoin is investment and savings. It, it just does all those things uh, together. Maybe let's start off with, with that. Um, what is Bitcoin for you? And 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 uh, repeat like what what you said earlier with like Bitcoin is all all, all those things and, and then let's break it down a little bit. So, Bitcoin is a lot of things, and that's part of why you're able to get away with putting out a new podcast every day is because it is that nuanced, and every person that becomes interested in Bitcoin puts their they reflect their own value sets on the Bitcoin. So for me, what that means is the things that I value are going to be similar in some ways, but also slightly different than just about anyone. So, I mean, it, it kind of it's kind of hard to say exactly where to start with that question. But for me, ultimately, Bitcoin is freedom money. I love it for. The fact that it's kind of the opposite of what fiat represents, which I see, I see it as a form of slavery that, you know, it's a soft form. We're not forced to use fiat, but at the end of the day, you kind of are. I mean, it's hard to function in this world without, you know, participating in that. And I think that Bitcoin maximalist can envision a world where we can choose to not operate in their system and that that's the hope and the vision i think for that that keeps me motivated and uh makes me want to contribute is when we look back in history with slavery uh, it's really interesting for me uh, and i made i think this was one of my first viral posts actually on twitter where i compared like the slavery that has happened uh, years ago in the in the past to what we have now with the fear system and there are surprisingly a lot of similarities but obviously in the methods of slavery it's a 
whole different level. It's a whole different thing. It's a, as you said, soft slavery. Uh, it, it, it's a good word to describe it. Um, will we get past this? Like, is 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 that uh, a thing that is right now there, or uh, will governments always be in the position where they can print money and where they can uh, extract value uh, without asking for taxes and asking for fees? Um, it depends. It's up to us, actually, I believe. I don't think that there's any reasonable possibility that they could enforce uh, slavery on global population with the numbers we have uh, as people uh, without, without it being voluntary. So I like to take the Jeff Booth approach to that concept. I think Bitcoin has already won this, this uh, question you're talking about. It's just a matter of people understanding and recognizing it. And I think that's just a matter of the speed of the distribution of knowledge, which I'm, I'm thinking eight to 12 years before we're talking about how much better things are on a Bitcoin standard. I did, that's an amazing, um, I, I rarely do that, but uh, we have the end routine, as you're well aware, uh, where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest. And uh, this end routine just fits really nicely in here. So I will put it now. Uh, and and the question for me was in my head like that. Why are people still uh, n not getting Bitcoin? And the end routine question from the previous guest was, what is the best way to accelerate Bitcoin adoption? And it's Talking like it. when... when just talking about it. it it's, it's, a, it's a miracle. Uh, and I think it's a bona fide miracle in the sense that this thing is happening, whether anyone knows about it or wants, wants it to happen. It's already, it's been happening for 15 years. It's growing at an accelerating rate. And you can try to ignore it, but that will only be to your detriment, in my opinion. Um, I'm trying to tell as many people about it as I can on a regular basis, because this is a total paradigm shift. We've never seen anything like this in our lifetimes. I mean, this is legit like the industrial revolution for the digital world. That's what's happening right now. Yeah, it's, it's also fascinating for me when we see the revolutions going on. I, I, we had the uh, episode with, with the guys one where I asked him, what is bigger, like the internet revolution or the, the Bitcoin revolution? Uh, and he went on like, I think, a 20 minute streak where, where he talked about exactly that. Do, do you also see it? I, I think he kind of came to the conclusion they are complementing each other and the internet would not be a good thing without Bitcoin, it, it kind of gets in a dystopian uh, thing. Yeah, I, I can definitely agree with a lot of what he had to say about that philosophically. Um, I would say on top of that, I would say that these things, they don't only complement each other, they actually synergize. So what, what I mean by synergize is I think you have the internet by itself is one thing, you have Bitcoin by itself is another thing. Combined, they more than equal the Bitcoin plus the internet. It's like this third thing that is like 10 times more powerful than either one of them separately. It's, it's, uh, it's really cool. Uh, but let's get to the, to the question that I actually had uh, in, in store for you. Um, as it's your first podcast, um, maybe who are you <laughs> and, and, and what are you doing in, in Bitcoin and how was your, your Bitcoin journey? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would say I'm just a normal guy, uh, born and raised in Michigan, uh, done a little traveling. I did commercial fishing in Alaska for six years uh, after graduating from Bible college up there. Um, so that was super interesting. I did that through college and uh, and afterwards. Uh, been married for 14 years, almost 15 years now. I met her when I was five and she was four. And uh, we grew up as friends. And uh, one day the, the scales were lifted from my eyes and I saw the wondrous beauty I had before me. And uh, 
I'm very thankful for how that's worked out. Um, but no, it's, it's it. A lot of things in life are like that, I guess. From my experience, I think Bitcoin has been like that. Where I'll, I guess I'll speak to my uh, Bitcoin journey, rabbit hole, whatever. Um, I had a friend who told me about it in 2011. He was a he was a web developer from high school, like in the late 90s, early 2000s. He always knew all about uh, everything going on in the tech space and. He, we were joking about mining uh, Bitcoin in 2011 as this like fake, you know, internet scam that people were uh, trying to pull off. And he's like, hey, if we got a thousand Bitcoin, this could be like worth millions of dollars someday. I'm like, no way. This is stupid. You know, this is they're just trying to get people to give them their money. Um, so that's that was my initial contact point. And obviously that's, you know, not the way it worked out uh, overall had a good friend uh, kind of put it back on my radar back in 2017, uh, December, when we had that big run up to like 17, 18,000. I'm like, what in the world is going on here? Like, how could this fake random internet thing uh, be, get, be garnering this much attention? How could people want to spend 20 grand on a, what's a Bitcoin, you know? Um, but I was in the middle of growing a startup company and uh, didn't really have time to figure it out. Or at least I, that's what I thought was true because I was, you know, trying to grow a company and uh, working 10 hours a day, six or seven days a week and just didn't want to take the time to even think about it, really. It seemed too risky, even if I thought there might be some potential with it. Um, 2020, I... Uh, a friend of mine told me about Jeff Booth and the Price of Tomorrow, and I got that on audiobook. And I'm just like, this guy is talking about some really crazy stuff, but it makes perfect sense. <laughs> with the, you know, we should be having deflation with all this new technology. We should uh, be experiencing the benefits of these things, and it seems like things are getting worse. And that doesn't really make sense. That's so. a that, that, that's a big step, and it's 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 for me also interesting always to see those stories uh, when when people talk about uh, their Bitcoin journey, uh, because you always see there's a point where they dismissed it, as I also did uh, for three years because I thought it's a scam, uh, and and then there's this point where either the environment or the price or a friend or anything pushed him or her to look at it twice and really look at it. And then you're like, oh, it could be something or, oh shit, that is actually true what they say. And and then it's like this ego humbling machine uh, where like, oh yes, I made a mistake. I was looking at it wrong, but now I have to go over my ego and say I was wrong. Uh, and especially hurtful when you have to say it publicly, uh, as for example, Michael Saylor did, because he said uh, um, uh, Bitcoin uh, days are numbered in like 2013 or something like that, like way before yeah. he came in. Yeah. Uh, a lot of other people. And I think to this day, the people that start out as big Bitcoin critics, as, bit, uh, as almost maybe even like Bitcoin haters, they will become the biggest Bitcoin bulls. Uh, because they really yeah. say like, oh, it's then and then. But when they make a switch, they will make the switch massively. <laughs> yeah, it's well, you have the people who are the most outspoken in society and they're going to be outspoken about whatever their opinion is. And if that opinion changes based on facts, then they tend to go a 180 and become proponents of the very thing that they were persecuting previously. Absolutely. And and you also talked that you were in a in the Bible college. Uh, it's, it's some, uh, I'm going gonna, gonna to imagine a Bible college is like a, a Christian thing. It was. It is a Christian university. Uh, you know, I went there. It was really inexpensive and I wanted to get out of my parents' house. I thought, you know, this could be a really good way to learn more about God and not go into debt until I figure out what I'm going to be doing for a career. I didn't really have any uh, significant ideas that I thought would uh, 
be worth pursuing at that time. So I'm just like, let's go off and have an adventure, not, not rack up, you know, meaningless debt and uh, just see what happens. I ended up with an amazing experience there. Got to grow up, got to, you know, learn about what I truly believe and dedicate the time to really figuring that out versus kind of getting into a later stage of life before I figured out more about who I am, I guess. It, 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 it was an accelerated period of uh, self-discovery and I think understanding the world in a, in a better way. Yeah. And it's, it's, uh, it's interesting for me also to see uh, a lot of religious people are in Bitcoin. <laughs> it's a lot, a lot of uh, people who are in, in, I can in, tell you why please religious people, Christians, I think, uh, most prominently are used to looking at the world from a different system. So we, have, are... we have an advantage, like even somebody who has been raised in religious circles, but doesn't personally em have a em embrace a faith. They already understand the mindset that it takes to understand a system outside of the current system. That's yeah. I never heard that because when, when you have, uh, an already, when you have one thing, and this is also with Bitcoin true, uh, once you get Bitcoin and you accept that there is something completely different from the mainstream, there's like, oh, that's, that's true. That's actually, we don't need inflation. Actually inflation is bad. Uh, and, and then you have this sound money thing when that you adopt in your head and like, what, what else is not true? Like, is, is that not, not true? Is that not true? Uh, could there be something? And then you're open to the idea that, uh, there's something outside of the mainstream. Like you, you step out of the line and all of a sudden you, you, you see, uh, things from a different way. Well, you can, you can, I can actually also go just there. I don't need to go directly in that lane. Uh, I can also just pursue my own thing in, in that lane. So yeah, I never looked at it that way from, uh, that, the, that the Christians have an advantage in that sense, because they kind of look at it in a different sense at all. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I mean, as a Christian, I don't believe that this physical tangible world is the end of things. I believe that there's another dimension where God exists and that he communicates with us in this dimension. And so I'm already used to thinking about the world in a different way. So when the idea of a Bitcoin comes up and the, the premise is laid out, it's like, this is, this is logical. This is healthy. This is, beneficial to society we should want this and it turns out it's happening whether we want it or not <laughs> so i mean uh why not embrace the inevitable and choose bitcoin i mean it's a much better financial system than anything we've ever considered before and i don't think that there's really any realistic chance we're going to come up with something better i i also don't think so it's it's uh when we're on the religious uh, side it's it's god's money <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's the most fair money i think that humans are capable of coming up with and if that if that's all it is i think that's good enough and the total addressable market is all the money which is you know People have their own ideas about what that number is, but it's all the stuff denominated in, in Bitcoin is, is the value of Bitcoin. I mean, when Bitcoin is actually money and everybody accepts it as money at some point, uh, Bitcoin is 50% of everything because in every transaction, yep. everything that we are doing, there is money involved in that. I mean, there's money. barter, but uh, it's, it's, it's yep. like money is on a global scale. Bitcoin is the counterpart to the stuff. It's the, it's the mirror reflection. So when we're valuing things, if we're trying to use a fiat currency, we're using a mirror that's from like one of those clown houses that distorts things. And we can't really tell if we're short or if we're tall or if we're fat or if we're skinny, it's distorting our perception of reality. And what Bitcoin is, it's just 
a mirror that tells us the truth. Yeah, 100%. I love it so much because it's a reflection of our values. As you said in the beginning, uh, that, uh, that we put the values that we self have onto Bitcoin and it's like a reflection of that. It's a mirror of that. Uh, and it's, it's funny for me to see uh, the, the discussions online uh, on, on Twitter when people are like, oh, no, Bitcoiners have to be like vegan. No, Bitcoiners have to be uh, only eating meat. And, and, and then it's like, no, Bitcoin is that, Bitcoin is that. But in the end of the day, it's kind of nothing and everything at once. It's like it, it's just it's just a tool that's there. Uh, it's apolitical, uh, but it, people put something on it. And that uh, that makes it really interesting for me to see that there's there's something that's we also talked uh, about before about the concept of Bitcoin is fluid. Uh, yeah. It gets it, it, it's it's just there and it's it's pushes forward in the direction that it's just pushes us forward. Uh, it will be interesting to, to to see this whole whole thing uh, playing out there. The thing is, we have the two different things going on at the same time. We have on the one hand, Bitcoin is completely objective and unchangeable, but then the value extrapolation component of it is something that we all individually determine. So it's, it's a dichotomy is what's going on. Do, do you see the adoption being similar to the, the early internet? To, to like the 1998, 1997, before the, the big uh, dot, dot com uh, bubble was there. I, I, I obviously, yes, I was yes, born in yes, 1998. No. I, would say, I would say not as much as, it's not a straight comparison. And there's a few reasons why I think that's true. Um, the first reason I would say that the comparison breaks down is I think that there was a lot less uh, at stake uh, from a perception standpoint for nation states. So fiat currency is a very obvious power vector for nation states. They all know what Bitcoin is. Okay. It's just a matter of if it's going to become big enough to cause problems. And we know that it is, <laughs> but um, so, yeah, I would just say that, uh, the internet wasn't really like that. It, there, there was the potential for them to not be able to control information, but I think that that's easier to control even within a somewhat democratized or decentralized, uh, you know, you have the internet, which is kind of what Bitcoin is to money. You have the internet is to information. But if they control the algorithm or Google controls the algorithm that shows you what information they want you to see, it, it's kind of like controlled opposition in a way. Uh, I don't think Bitcoin really has that component and therefore it's much more dangerous to the existing system. It, it, it's going to mathematically determine outcomes for nations. And there's going to be no way around that. You can, you can uh, put out propaganda and, and control the narrative through information. You can't do that with, with money in the same way that, that gets people to believe something that isn't true. If that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I think about that a lot because I feel like in the Western world, the pain is just not high enough. It's like... Uh, inflation is, is high, people talk about it, but not that much. And I, I watch my the, the European election debates because I'm curious about what the topics are. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. not that curi uh, curious about the positions because they are pretty, you, you know what the politicians will say, but I'm curious like what topics they are discussing. Yes, inflation is one of the topics. But it's actually a pretty small topic in the European elections and in the Austrian uh, view of the European ele election where I'm living. Um, and pretty extremely big is migration again with uh, the Ukraine war. How to handle Putin? That's a really big topic right now. And I'm like, it, 
Yes, it is a big topic, but it's not the only topic. It's like the the, the one topic that they always discuss, and it's it kind of gets uh, get, gets even annoying that it's so present. Uh, and and there are not too many other topics like the in, inflation is a little bit there. Ah, yes, what should we do with immigration and stuff like that? But no word about Bitcoin, no word about cryptos. In in, in America, it's different. Yeah, I know what you're talking about, and. It's really easy, I think, to get sucked into hoping that politics will change things for the better. Um, And it can, and it has before, but it's always temporary um, because somebody gets in for a couple years, four years, five years, whatever the term is. They make some changes that you wanted to see. People grow complacent. And then somebody comes in and undoes all those good things and it gets worse. And then they, it, it, I just think that it's almost a distraction from the, the real solution, which is fixing the money. If you take the money printer out of their hands and they can't make these promises to redistribute other people's wealth, then they're going to have a really hard time selling the things that they're selling right now they're going to actually have to provide value if they want to get elected and that's bitcoin is the solution honestly to these political you know career politicians i don't think they'll exist under a bitcoin standard and if they do it will be because that everyone agrees that person needs to be in that position because of the value that they're providing to society. I think there's a really good chance that by the time Bukele comes up for, you know, I I think he's, he's serving his second term, which I think the term limits, I think the demand might be so high for him to continue that he may not have a choice, even if he wants to step down. It's it's fascinating for me to see uh, El Salvador's thing. uh, And, I want to get into El Salvador a little later, uh, but you mentioned something really interesting. Uh, we only have something when we put value to it. This means all of this. Also, we only pay for government functions that we actually value. For example, uh, I would be definitely okay with some centralized organization in Austria cleaning the streets, uh, holding the streets in a good condition. Uh, and like it's, and it, it has a lot of advantages also Do not pay for each turn you take and, and pay some other private person and then see how you, how you get on the streets. Uh, and it doesn't have to be organized with, with taxes. It can be just service based. And I heard that a lot with Bitcoiners who think when, when Bitcoin is fully adopted, we kind of switch to a, an optional service-based uh, government function that will be completely different than uh, we are now used to. And it's, for me, really hard to imagine that world. Uh, but I, I, I can see it because Bitcoin is so different than the fiat system. Uh, why should not be the political system also be completely different? But what, what do you think? So this is, I think it's pretty simple. If a person that's running for an office can't promise to give money to a special interest group, like they don't have the ability to deliver on that promise and everybody knows that that's not going to happen, they lose their ability to persuade the public to vote for them. And at that point, they have to actually have a a proposal that provides real value And how they're going to accomplish that in a tangible way. I think that Bitcoin forces people to be smarter about the things that people are telling them. Like, hey, is this realistically financially possible? Well, if the answer is no and you can't print money, then you're a liar and everybody knows it. If you are listening to this podcast, you might be wondering what is actually the setup look like of Robin or how can I improve my Bitcoin setup? And there's two things. You have to buy Bitcoin from the right source and you have to store Bitcoin the right way. Let's focus on the first thing. 
how to buy Bitcoin. It's simple. Have a Bitcoin only exchange. Don't deal with the shitcoin exchanges. Don't deal with an exchange that has an own token or something like that. Be on a Bitcoin only exchange. I use 21 Bitcoin. 21 Bitcoin is for me the best partner for that. And now where do you store Bitcoin? Bitcoin should be stored on a hardware wallet on a self-custody solution where you yourself hold your keys and it should be a cold wallet. So that's my simple solutions. That's a bit box. You just put your Bitcoin on there, back up your seed phrase, and you are better than 95% of all Bitcoin hodlers. If you have more than a thousand euros in Bitcoin, it's an absolutely must have. One last thing before we get back to the video. I'm really passionate about meeting other Bitcoiners. And there's an amazing opportunity in middle of Europe in June, the Bitcoin Prague conference. It's the best and biggest Bitcoin only conference in the whole of Europe. For all Americans, please visit Europe and visit this place in June. For all Europe's, it's a must go anyways. You are so close to the Bitcoin Prague conference, you basically have to come. I will do interviews there and I would love to meet you all there. Use code ROBIN for all my sponsors to get discounts and use the links down in the description. And there's also a common theme that I saw, uh, except of one part in Austria, everyone wanted to like say, oh no, we have to spend here more money. No, 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 I, we, we should spend here more money. And nobody was like, let's cut some money. Let's, let's, like, let's dial a little bit back. Let's, let's cut those budgets. Let's cut those budgets. They all like, no, no, we have to, uh, we, we have to put more money towards that. We have to put more money that we have to build out that. And I'm like, they, <laughs> I don't think they have, um, an income problem. They have like an, an expense problem, uh, when I yeah. look at the government and the server, but, uh, let's not go to get too much into politics. No, no. So real quick on that last, on that last point you made, uh, Bitcoin will be very healthy considering our current global debt situation, because, Bitcoin is sa a savings technology and the, the technological innovation is that it incentivizes people to save rather than to spend. So if we're incentivized to, to voluntarily forego purchasing today for future benefit, because we believe there's more benefit in the future by not spending, we're basically making the, the decision that we don't want to fuel the debt-based system that we currently have, if that makes yes. sense. Yeah, it's, it, it is for, for me, it's also like that. When, when, when you have a uh, Bitcoin as, as, as your choice, it's, it's, it's like, it's even like a vote. It's like, I, I, I want that system and it is a way more powerful vote and way more powerful step to take than just like once every five years you go to a small house and you write a name on, on, on that list and you try to hope for, for change. Uh, but uh, voting every day with Bitcoin, uh, and that's, which brings me now to El Salvador, which is really interesting for me to, to, to see a country where this game theory is playing out now, where we started to have a country which is bullish on Bitcoin. The only thing, and this is why I thought about that, uh, only thing, uh, as you said, even when politicians do something, it's temp it's usually temporary because uh, they get out of they get out of uh, the office, uh, or they they don't want to do, or they come even on a bad path. Like there can a lot of things happen that uh, corrupts a politician. How, how long term? Like, do, do you think this El Salvador thing is is set in a really solid direction now, where it's like? It's, it's pretty sure that they will end up in a, in a good uh, situation. Um, it's, it's like, a, a, for, for me, it's like almost too good to be true story till now. It's like they, they, yeah, they, they, yeah. they really did a lot of things on a lot of different levels, uh, even outside of Bitcoin with the gangs and with the passports and everything. So, you know, I think it, it shows how important people are. So you got one man who's basically in charge there. I mean, he has a lot of power within that country and people seem to be very comfortable vesting that power in his office and, and to be happy with the decisions that he's making within that role. I, I think this is kind of an experiment. 
And with the results that they're having, I think I don't think this is the last time we'll see this experiment. Um, I mean, you got Maya wanting to change things around in Suriname. You got Bukele and Mile uh, hanging out last week. I mean, probably no reason, right? Uh, They're just having coffee. Probably just chilling, you know, talking about soccer or football or whatever you want to call it. Um, no, I mean, these are really smart guys who I think they want to do some positive things for the world. And it, they know what Bitcoin is. And this is they're going to be a part of it. And I think that they're trying to approach this in a healthy way because, you know, like Hayek said, you got to have this has got to be kind of introduced in a sly roundabout way to some degree. I mean, El Salvador has Bitcoin as legal tender, but their national currency is U.S. dollars. So they are still operating within that system. But Bukele is coming out and saying, look, guys, the Federal Reserve is scamming you. <laughs> you know, he's talking about it, at, you know, at CPAC and on Tucker Carlson. Hey, the Federal Reserve is not federal and there's no reserves. So, you know, make sense out of that, however you will. Uh, it's, uh, I, I love it a lot, what's going on with, uh, with Nate Bukele. And it's, he's, I think he's, he's even underrated. He's such a... He's oh, such yeah. an intelligent oh, yeah. guy, and, and he's really thoughtful with what he's doing. And um, I, I'm curious to see what's, what's happening. I'm planning on going uh, in this November to finally go down myself. Uh, I've invited so many guests already from El Salvador on my podcast, talked with so many people. They all said I should come. At, uh, I think I should definitely come this year if, it, if I can make it. Uh, but uh, it will be really great to see this Um Bitcoin country also important that it's not a, a crypto country that like right. that Nayib Bukele yeah. kind of set the stage really early on with like no it's 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 Bitcoin uh, and not not crypto. Did you had some uh, some experimentation with with a crypto when you came into Bitcoin? No, I. The thing is, I'm very risk averse. I I tend to not want to put money into anything that I think could go down. Like. I'll give you an example. I, I sold my company in September of 2021 and I took 10% of that immediately, uh, put it in a money market account. And I said, I'll, I want to go 70, 30 conservative. I, I don't, what, I just want this money to not go down. I don't want to lose money here. You know, this is a lot. This is everything I've worked for. I just want this to be safe. The bond, 70% bonds, 30% equities went down 11% in three months, dude. <laughs> and I'm like, if, it's, if this is my downside with no upside, I might as well just be throwing this uh, 100% into equities or something else. So I shut that down. And I'm like, I need to figure out how to not lose my money. And that's when about... Six months later, I became a Bitcoin maximalist after really looking into this. It's like it was really a matter of self-preservation that led me to finally totally figure it out. Is, is, is um, Bitcoin maximalism, does this mean more to you outside of just being financially focused on Bitcoin? Is it, is the, I often feel like it's a, a, even a philosophy, a way of life. <laughs> Yeah, it is. I mean, I really love the forced austerity. And if, if you don't know what that means, basically, Bitcoin motivates you to not spend money frivolously. And, you know, building a multimillion dollar company, having a multiple seven figure exit, you tend to be a little bit more carefree, especially if you've worked really hard and have been saving and didn't have money. And then all of a sudden you come into a large amount of resources. It can, it can mess you up. And honestly, I wasn't totally prepared for that dynamic. One thing I love about Bitcoin is it it's incentivized discipline. So you are financially incentivized to, to make disciplined choices with your money. Um, 
investing in general is like that, but Bitcoin is so much more clear because of the rate of return. If you're imagining putting your money in the stock market, okay, I, I might lose out on a 10% gain this year if I spend this money rather than investing it. Most people are kind of like, well, I know it adds up over time, but I'll make it up. It, it doesn't matter. Um, most investors are people who are putting their extra money or retirement money they can't touch anyways into an index fund. For people who understand Bitcoin's going up 100% a year, you know, anytime you're choosing to spend money on something, you're like, am I comfortable spending twice as much on this? Or am I comfortable spending three times as much as the, as today's price? Because that's the opportunity that I'm choosing to forego. I'm shorting Bitcoin if I'm, if I'm consuming uh, my resources. It's, uh, I made a tweet yesterday with, with my new studio and I was writing, uh, sorry guys, I'm short Bitcoin. <laughs> so, so, someone actually thought uh, I'm not joking. And he's like, oh, I think you should invest in Bitcoin. <laughs> But yeah, well, I mean, we, we all have to draw our, li our line somewhere and, you know, we need we don't really want Bitcoin. We want the things that Bitcoin will get us and we think Bitcoin will get us 10 times more in the future. That's what that's what it is. As you're building companies and you are uh, also like involved in, in, in uh, you are involved in companies, building them up um, with your insights, why why do you think that? not more companies already copied Michael Saylor's strategy. There are companies coming up and we had, I think last week, the, the news with uh, Salem, uh, the, I, I forgot the name, but the, it was, uh, it, it wasn't a new scientific something. Um, why, why don't more companies just copy that strategy? What What is holding companies back to put uh Bitcoin, like maybe even like 5%, it doesn't have to be like 100% all in like Michael yeah. It's not about a percentage allocation at this point. It's just very inconvenient. Um, I would say that the hurdles, you'd have to be in a Michael, Michael Saylor position basically to accomplish what he did, which is more than 50% of the voting rights in the company or a couple really strong allies. And then you have to understand it to the degree where you're willing to put hundreds of millions or billions of dollars on the line and risk your career, your life, your reputation uh, in a way where you may not even be rewarded uh, individually for the upside. So if you're putting a company's resources on the line, you don't stand to necessarily benefit personally from that if that makes sense. So for a resource allocator like uh, Tim Cook, if he puts Bitcoin on the balance sheet, let's say he bought $10 billion worth of Bitcoin, the price spikes, the Apple stock does well, and he gets some financial benefit from that. But the risk in his mind may be that if this goes poorly, I look very foolish because this is so early. You know what I mean? So it's the reputation, reputational risk along with the lack of perceived personal uh, short-term upside, I think is what really keeps most companies from participating and the accounting rules. So they've been treat, they have a very poor treatment in the US until now for Bitcoin as an asset. Um, it's an it's an impaired asset, meaning you can only write it down when it goes down and you have to write it at its lowest value under your ownership. But when it goes back up, you can't realize that appreciation. They changed the FASB accounting rules uh, or they changed it to FASB accounting rules where now you can mark to market your Bitcoin as of 2024. I don't know if it's current or by end of year. Uh, a sailor was talking about it recently. Um, that's a game changer. And that's why you see there are there are companies that are starting to put put it on their balance sheet. And it's because of the accounting rules. So it's just like we're early. We're just, we're just early, man. We're just early. That's all it is. 
<laughs> it's, it all it all comes down always uh, always to that because uh, if Bitcoin would be more mature already, like five uh, five years down the road, uh, then it would not be a reputational risk for the CEO to put uh, Bitcoin on the balance sheet. It would be just a reputational risk if he does not put Bitcoin on the balance sheet because Correct. everybody all, all of a sudden does it and he looks foolish if he not does it and he has to explain himself when he not uh, puts put, puts Bitcoin on, on the balance sheet. Yeah, it, it's going to flip at some point. So it's we're, we're probably, like, it's like a meter, it's like this, and it's going to eventually be, you're taking the opposite risk if you don't participate. And it's not really a matter of if, it's a matter of when, because this is already happening. Like we can see it happening in real time. So it's more about where are we, where is that meter at, and when is it going to flip? That's kind of that's really the question at this point, from my from my vantage point. I love it. And uh, on that note, um, as as money is extremely essential for for businesses to operate and and and, and do stuff, uh, and Bitcoin is kind of just changing how money works and replacing the the current financial system. If we play that far to the end, um, how? How different will be the business world, or will it even be uh, different uh, when we look at how startups grow, how uh, big uh, global companies work? Uh, I, I heard, I think yesterday or the day before yesterday, I had an interview uh, who said uh, Bit uh, Bitcoin and sound money uh, forces the economy to be a little bit more regionalized, localized, and a little bit more decentralized. Uh, he does not think that this big global uh, companies will be uh, able to scale in the same way. Uh, he sees it a little bit more as more decentralized. Um, wh what are your thoughts on, on, on what Bitcoin standard does for businesses? Yeah, I don't, I don't know that I would totally agree with that. I would say I would look at it more like this. Bitcoin forces you to become a master resource allocator because if you can't do that, you should just own Bitcoin. Like if you have something that has a track record of going up 50, 100, 150% a year, just holding on to it and doing nothing, it raises the bar to you. Ha That's your hurdle rate now. Your Bitcoin is now your hurdle rate as a business investor. If this opportunity doesn't have more than a 50% chance of a 100% annual return, you're probably misallocating your resources. So I think the second and third order effect of that is only the very most valuable business ideas receive investment in, in, in a Bitcoin standard. Everything else, all this crap that nobody cares about that works because money was borrowed at 3% interest or 2% interest. These things don't add, they're not a good allocation of resources and they go away when money is properly valued. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's even in, even in my personal life, um, I'm way more careful and thinking like, really like, does this thing add value to my life? It was really right. easy with the podcast setup because I want to have high quality videos and I uh, want to put out good uh, Bitcoin content. Um, but other things, I'm really quick to uh, just change and, and do like, I, I can do it maybe other way. And uh, the thing that you said also earlier with like, can I, would I buy this thing if it would be 10x the price or 5x the price or whatever the, the X is? Because this literally can happen this year to Bitcoin. <laughs> uh, I, I don't think it will go that crazy this year because well, uh, just, it will be all you got to do is double it because that's your that's kind of what's been happening on the average, double triple. If you can double it and the price and the and you can't justify the price, then skip it. O only buy things that you also would buy uh, when it was double the price and you actually value it. Like it, it makes you uh, value things more. 
like it makes you think before you before you spend this this low time preference thing it it makes you value your economic energy properly it's it's a mirror it's that mirror concept it's just taking your resources and saying it, is it worth putting my the, the future value of my economic energy into this thing I want right now. And if you believe that your the economic value that you've already created till now will be 10, 100 times more valuable in the future, you need to you need to uh, protect it at all costs. If that makes sense. Did, did something for for you change in your personal or professional life when you adopted Bitcoin or were you already kind of in this mindset? You know, I was raised very, very risk averse. Uh, if you're familiar with Dave Ramsey, my dad always thought, you know, don't ever have any debt of any kind. I kind of bought that to some degree. And I think it's a generally a wise approach. Not that borrowing money is inherently negative, but you're adding risk and you're adding resources that you didn't already earn. So you're, you're, you're laid with the responsibility of allocating resources that, that you didn't actually uh, already provide the value to have in your possession. So it's, I think it's a, a bad idea for young entrepreneurs to borrow money for an idea. As an, as an extreme example, like, a publicly traded company that's burning millions in cash every month that has no path to profitability. You can, you can apply that on an individual basis and come up with a, a reasonable assessment of it. Uh, before we get uh, to the end routine, uh, I'm, I'm kind of introducing that new question before the end routine, because I want to get to know uh, what the Bitcoiners are passionate about besides Bitcoin itself. Uh, sure. So the question for you, what are you currently learning about? What are you currently doing? Uh, um, or what are you currently passionate about besides Bitcoin? Is, is there anything that stands out to you? I I think that there's some overlap into Bitcoin with, with a lot of different things that I'm interested in. Um, I'll just use this as an example. Uh, just this week, I've been getting... Uh, so I have a... A, an elementary school that we founded in 2019 in Uganda. And my director there is an amazing guy. Uh, we've got like almost 300 students, uh, like 90 kids are uh, in distressed families or orphans that, you know, we have them coming tuition free. It's, it's really uplifting the, the community in an in amazing way. We put the only well in for like 10 miles. So everybody comes every day for water to the school but so that the school and the education is is a, a part of the answer to the question that you're asking. But how Bitcoin fits in is every time I would wire money to the director of my school, they're taking a forty dollar fee, and they're taking the the bank in Uganda is taking a twelve percent cut. So twelve percent, twelve percent. So. We're getting hammered on both sides. We just did our first Bitcoin transactions this week because it, it, it's been difficult to get him on board because they had some really bad scams a couple years ago in Uganda and like the government's against it. So I was, you know, I've been explaining like circular economy concepts uh, in like peer to peer. And we figured out that he can do uh, tether to local currency and we can we can work around it. Uh, our last uh, transaction cost like a dollar and thirty cents uh, to get him the same amount of money. We would have lost seventy, eighty, ninety dollars before. Yeah, so. that, 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 that's kind of the only thing also that makes sense outside of uh, of Bitcoin with with the stable coins. If you want to move money across uh, yeah. and 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 don't use the existing uh some throat cutting <laughs> uh yeah. in financial institution where you get massive cut like 12 percent is just like 
the how do they justify such a big cut? <laughs> Because there's no other choice. I mean, they they have a monopoly. That's a monopoly interest rate, if you think about it. Um, so I I guess my passion right now largely boils down to learning and teaching, like taking uh, complicated concepts and trying to understand them, wrap my brain around them. I'm not naturally gifted at that. It's something that I have a passion for. But it takes me a lot of time to understand things on a deep level. But then once I have it, I feel like I have something that I can make easier for the next person to understand. So uh, learning the hardest things I'm capable to learn and then trying to distill that into something maybe more attainable for somebody who doesn't have the time or the energy to to put into it, I guess, was how I, is how I would try to say it. And that's, a, that's an amazing thing uh, to do. Um, we already got the end routine today. <laughs> but, uh, I, I, so I would just uh, end with like when people would like to get reach out to you, want to uh, ask you questions, where can they find you? Where can uh, people ask you questions? Um, I mean, I'm on Twitter. I uh, I usually check, check on there a few times a day. So... Uh, Let me just confirm my Twitter handle. I can I can give it to you and that you can put it in the bio if you want. I have um, it in the description every uh, all the time from all the guests. I have yeah. at least one contact link and it's 99% of the time it's a Twitter link. Uh, so people yeah. can at least check something out. I mean, Twitter is good. I mean, just DM me on Twitter and we can figure out the best way to connect from there. Perfect. Then uh, thank you, Michael, for, for being on. Uh, thank you for being on the show. Great. Awesome, Robin. Appreciate it. Perfect. And for everyone watching, thank you for watching. And uh, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode.